Artistic expression is at the foundation of who we are as a global community. It has the power to transcend and transform. Skyline College Creative Arts introduces you to creative thought leaders in the visual and performing arts as they share their personal and professional journeys, providing insight into the creative process, illuminating career pathways, and shining a spotlight on the impact of creative arts in cultural and social movements. Skyline College takes you inside the revolutionary realm of creative arts. Join us as we go Behind the Curtain. Hi, gorgeous. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Welcome, Rita. Good, how are you? Hi. I feel like I haven't seen you in forever. I know. And then, and then I feel like I see you all the time in this weird way, <laughs> like in my mind. Right? Or I turn on the TV and there you are. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank God. Hi. Mama's thank got great skills. Well, thank you so much, Marita, for doing this for us. So I just want to get started by saying, tell, tell us about yourself. Being born in Maryland, tell, tell us about who you are. Um, I am, yeah, I was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland, and I started in dance and ballet. And um, I always say my dining salon was hilarious. And I started getting <laughs> dance parts because I was funny. And um, then they found out that I could sing. And I sang in choirs and, and like I did acapella and all that stuff. And then way back in a million, a million years ago, don't tell anyone how old I am, but I guess I'm the same age as Gary. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But I went to one of the only schools that had a musical theater program because in olden times, there were only about maybe 10 schools that had a musical theater program. So I went to Syracuse. Um, I was waitlisted at Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> and then, and then uh, at the last second, I was, when I got into Carnegie Mellon, I was like, nah, I want to go to Syracuse. It seems more fun and orange is my favorite color. And, um, and I did the musical theater program at Syracuse. And, um, I found out my strength there, even though I was a good singer dancer, was acting, which was bizarre. Um, and then I started, I did like what everybody else did. I did summer stock and um, did theme park with Gary. <laughs> we did Bush Gardens. Woo! And, um, and then I was in New York auditioning our school, Syracuse did a showcase and um, I got an agent from that, a few agents. And I started doing commercials and movies and, and then I got cast. One of my goals was to um, originate a role in a musical. So I got cast as Pocahontas. Um, and they, this is when Disney theatricals would do tryouts at Disney MGM, which I think is called Hollywood Studios now. And I uh, played Pocahontas there. And I went through the Disney machine and they redid my eyebrows, redrew them. That's why I have no eyebrows now. And, um, <laughs> and changed my hair and all the rest of it. Um, and then so the long and the short of it, I ended up in Los Angeles and started um, doing film and TV and then sit down productions. And then sometimes I go and tour of musical theater. And now I have two kids and I'm married and uh, still in LA. I love, me. I love it. So let's go back a little bit. When did you yeah. say in your mind, okay, I I'm kind of good. You know, I'm the funny girl, but I'm kind of good at this dancing thing. When did you make up your mind to say, okay, do, did you have to go to school? Was that a thing? Did you know you had to go to school? Or was there any other choice to just go straight to New York? Like, what was your thought process on that? I, um, my parents are, are first generation, old school. Um, my parents are from the Philippines. And so there was no choice. I had to go to college, some college <laughs> for something. Um, and so I knew that for me, I had to go to college. And I knew that I wasn't a strong enough, I wasn't strong, I wasn't competitive enough as a dancer or a singer. And I, and I heard, you go to one of these schools, they'll teach you how to do everything. If you get in and you work hard, <laughs> you will have a career. You might not be the star, but you, you will work. And that sounded really good to me. And I wanted the college experience. It seemed fun. So now um, you're at Syracuse, right? And yes. I I'm thinking musical theater back then, let alone at Syracuse, was not a very diverse program. No, it was not. I was one of the tokens, um, and I'm going to name drop because it's fun. Um, no, no, not no, because I went to school with these people. But um, 
there was like one of each. I think Carnegie Mellon might still do this, but um, but I was I was like sort of the ambiguous Latina Asian person. Um, there were a few other like I think K Diggs was in my class. He um, he was a black guy. I mean, for like I don't know how else to say it. He was African American. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, there was a few people. So all the tokens, we all glommed together. There was some Cuban kids, but we knew that was sort of our track. Oh, we yeah. come together. So you get, um, uh, and that, that thing that Syracuse does, that's, that's quite amazing. I didn't, you know, we didn't have that, uh, that performance for agents coming out of OCU. So I always thought that was so, so cool. So you come to New York, right? You get an agent. I, of course, know. But tell us really <laughs> about what it was like when you're getting up in the morning and you're saying, okay, like, like for, for Marita, like, what was your day? Like, how did you know this is how I had to structure my day to go out there and get some work? Um, well, the preparation always was from the night before or the day before. So I already knew that I had to usually, that it was a mix of auditions, it was a mix of open calls, like that we would just find way back in Backstage West or um, off of Equity. And um, you would plan your auditions and sort of map out where you were in the city, where you were going to be. And you'd have all your little supplies and you'd pack up your tap shoes <laughs> and your sheet music and all your stuff and warm up in the shower and wake up your roommates and everybody else. And, um, and you'd have all your stuff ready, like in your bag and um, make sure you ate something, grab a bagel probably on what was 54th street. We'd go and grab a bagel and then cut it up and you'd eat that bagel all day long. And we'd go from audition to audition with your little rolly bag. Um, and, and then for me, I was running to commercial auditions as well. So if I missed my time, I'd have to run like downtown to this and then cross town to that. And it was, it was running and I made sure I was wearing flats. And back then you didn't wear earrings because people rip out your earrings. <laughs> but <laughs> that, that's the New York we knew before it was Disneyfied. Before <laughs> pre Disney New York. Right. Um, yeah. And then like I would also plan in my head, like, hey, this casting office is nearby or this agent, like if I wanted to up level back then you, I think you still can in New York. I think you can still work with all these different agents. Um so I would always have headshots and resumes and I would swing by and drop off, do a drop off wherever I was. Like if, if there was, um, because I was doing print as well um, and some voiceover, which was crazy in New York. So I had, I had a cassette tape and I would drop off my cassette tape <laughs> at the different voiceover places. Our cassette tapes and our thousands of copies of black and white headshots. Oh. Yes. Yes. So and all my black and white headshots. So you are this, you know, you're coming out of one of the top musical theater schools. You get to New York. You are a five foot seven Filipina girl, <laughs> right? Yes. How right. Does that translate for you trying to get on Broadway, working in musicals. How was that? That was challenging. I oh, I'm gonna tell this story. I'm gonna tell this story. So I. So at the time, it was when Miss Saigon, the original Miss Saigon was out. And the whole thing was like, you're going to be on Miss Saigon. And um, so my whole life seemed to be auditioning for shows, making it to the end, and then being told that that person wasn't leaving the show because I could only fit one slot, say, in Miss Saigon or even Cats or whatever the show was because I'm 5'7". And if I was going to play Asian, I had to be 5'2". <laughs> and I was like, I didn't know I was going to saw off my legs. What am I going to do? <laughs> I can't be 5'2". <laughs> I just wasn't going to ever be 5'2". And 5'2 would be tall. Um, so, so, um, so I would get called back or made it to the end for a lot of tall girl musicals. I would book tours for the tall girl shows at the time. It was like crazy for you. Um, I sort of fell into like bossy stuff. I was fine. So um, I did productions in Chicago and I did Chorus Line and um, like where it just mattered more that I was tall or if I could deliver a joke, like I played Judy in a Chorus Line because Judy's funny. Um, so it, it just, it was hard because I didn't fit that. But the story I was going to tell real quick. Um, so the biggest manager who repped all the Miss Saigon girls was this woman, Jadine Wong. And so I finally got a meeting with her and she told me she could get me a Miss Saigon. And mind you, she was Asian American. And um, 
she said, I think the most racist thing anyone has ever said to me, is this okay, Gary? <laughs> oh, yeah, tell the truth. Okay, okay. Um, she took one look at me and she said, she said, change your name, because my last name's Delara, because um, I'm Spanish Filipino, actually Mexican Filipino. Um, <laughs> she said, change your name to Wong, cut some bangs, stay out of the sun, and lose that black ass. Ding, 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 right? Ding, That's ding, all. ding. Now. And I was like, I can't do any of those things except <laughs> cut bangs. <laughs> like I couldn't do, I couldn't. I was like, my ass isn't that big. <laughs> and I was like, please don't give me those bangs. Please don't have to. <laughs> so then I'd just be like tall and weird. Like I was like, I was like, this is not a box I could fit into. Um, so my agent at the time, Nancy Carson, um, at the Carson agency, I think she's, yeah, she's still, she must a friend of mine still. She told me there was an off-Broadway production of this musical honor song for Crazy Horse. Um, and she was like, any chance you have any Native American? And I was, I asked my dad, he's like, I think we're part Navajo or something. And, um, and I told Nancy that she said, good enough. <laughs> and um, I went and I sang and I got the part. So I did this off Broadway musical, and when I was playing indigenous people, it seemed to open up this whole world where I could be tall, um, I could be brown, <laughs> I could have a middle part, I could have my hair. I mean, at the time, I had hair past my booty, um, so I could be more myself. I could be American. Um, so once, yeah, and then, yeah. Oh. No, I think that's so cool because once you realized, you know, and, and I used to giggle, right? Because that was also the time we had the King and I, and don't you used to love when they used to tell you, oh, Marita, look, you have <laughs> and you have King and I. I'm like, she's five <laughs> or seven, what's she doing, right? Like, but, who am I gonna be? Like the Amazon? Like, who am I gonna be? <laughs> I mean, yeah. You were able to go into this, you know, this world of playing Native Americans, Disney kept, yes. kept calling. So, and of course, you know how I felt about the mouse. So tell us yes. about auditioning for the mouse, getting this at the mouse, and what that was like. You know what I mean? What you actually got to do produce, you know, this show, these tryouts was quite amazing. Tell us about that. Oh, boy. So um, the casting director for, um, for Disney, oh, gosh, my Tracy something. I can't remember her name now. She came to see Honor Song for Crazy Horse. And um, I played Black Shawl, and, and she um, she invited the female cast members. There were four of us to audition for Pocahontas. And like I didn't really know what Pocahontas was, or like I mean I didn't understand the musical part of it. The the movie hadn't come out yet. Um, so my agent like set up the appointment, and I think it was gosh I'm trying to remember where it was. It was near Steps. The appointment was somewhere near Steps Studios. And um, they sent me the sheet music and it was cool because it was like, you know, the original sheet music was handwritten by Stephen Schwartz. And you're like, ooh, that's cool. And, um, and it was Colors of the Wind and Just Around the River Band. And I was studying at the time with Bruce Cole and I took him my sheet music and he had coached Judy Kuhn on it already. So he told me exactly how to sing it, coached me perfectly. Because Judy Kuhn had recorded it already. And... Um, and then I went in and I, I dressed my idea of modern Pocahontas. I had this like beige, beigey wrap dress with like boots. <laughs> and, um, and I sang and then this isn't, I mean, this has not happened very many times. But after I sang, there was the casting director, a producer. Um, there was just like two people in the room. And after I sang, they said, you look exactly like Drawing. like our Disney image you're the exact height they had drawn her at the proportions of five seven your face shape matches exactly the specs we need you're the distance between your eyes you're exactly what we want so I'm gonna ask Chris one of the ladies who's working with us I think I have yeah. a picture of you at the Disney as Pocahontas uh, so, Chris, if you can go and see if you can find that picture of Marita while I do this. One of the questions we had, and you just answered it so perfect, was how specific do producers get in terms of physical traits and voice types? Like, I think you literally just answered it, right? It's so important. Well, that was so important. Also, um, Pocahontas was one of the first, I think Belle, actually, I'm lying, was the second um, Disney princess 
at the time that was not a soprano. Mm -hmm. And she was, she was a low mezzo. Polka was not, <laughs> she was not a, like, a, a, like that goes a little bit higher, but she was low. I have a low voice, which also is a weird musical theater. <laughs> right? <laughs> There's not a lot of mezzo leads. Not a lot of mezzo leads. My dad, I don't think I ever told you this. So my dad looked into our lineage and I got a tribal card. So yay, and Disney was happy. So, um, <laughs> so Disney was happy, I got a tribal card. Um, so they were like, yay, she's our girl. So I booked the part. Yes. And, um, yay, and they told me they're gonna fly me to Orlando and I'm gonna be this big star and it was this whole thing. And then two weeks before I was supposed to leave, I think Gary was already on tour with something, probably Chicago or something. Um, they tell me, oh, we're taking the part away from you. You're going to be the cover now. And um, you're going to be the cover. You're not our main girl anymore. We found someone we like better. And I, because I was 20, <laughs> 20 something, I told them, I told my agent to tell them to go after themselves and that I was going to LA because I was done. I had been called back for was it rent or I don't even remember, but it was one of these rents and cats. I was, I was called back to the end for cats every day. I was like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, if I get one more last uh, Broadway, oh, there I am. There she is. Oh, there I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that's a semi-permanent tattoo they did that. Those tattoos lasted for three months. They weren't playing. <laughs> I love it and I also love your hair was so long and they gave you that weave anyway yeah and then the weave ripped out my um the hair it ripped out my hair along my hairline so it's even better oh I love um, it <laughs> so you, told them, you told them to go take to go take a hike you told Disney to go take a hike I told Disney to go take a hike and then I went to LA because I had on uh, my eat my east coast agent had a west coast branch so I was like I'm gonna go be on uh not Dawson's Creek, but something stupid. I was like, I'm going to get a part on that. Everybody's bad on those stupid shows. I'll go be on one of those dumb shows. I decided. <laughs> and at that point, I had a few TV credits. I was like, all right, screw you, Broadway and, and musicals. And as soon as my plane landed, it was Disney and my agent. And they said, we need you to fly to Orlando now. The girl that we replaced you with lost her mind and left in the middle of the night. Can you come to Orlando yesterday and learn the whole show? Everybody else knows the show already. Can you come and learn the show? Now, mind you, this was in the 90s. And for those of us alive in the 90s, we liked to party. And I was like, I'm not singing anymore. So I was like partying in LA and drinking. I had no voice. I blew my voice out partying, running off with boys, acting crazy. But I like drank some coffee, packed up my crap. So all my stuff was half in New York. Um, some of my stuff was with me in LA. I just got on the plane and told everybody in LA and New York to ship me my stuff. And I landed still hungover in Orlando. And that, back then they couldn't email you the script. So by the time they expressed my script of the new show to LA and New York, I was already on the plane. So I hadn't heard the show. I hadn't seen the script. I just landed in Orlando and I had to learn that show in three days crazy and the show was double cast right. but um but because i looked like the animated girl i, I became the main girl right. so that was uh wild and yeah like they had everything ready for me like i went through like fed me through disney university um how you had to hold your hands and disney jazz hands which gary taught me before <laughs> not this one this <laughs> one and <laughs> even though Pocahontas didn't do any jazz hands and then I had to go into the studio and record tracks because in case I was one of like my voice went down they would track the show or track certain parts for stunts I had to learn stunts like do all this stuff and I was still hungover like the whole time <laughs> learning this <laughs> craziness I'd already put blonde highlights in my hair they were like what happened to you who are you they like dyed my hair back <laughs> And I just was thrown into a canoe and towed it around. And it was a different show than the Disneyland one. The one in uh, Orlando was Equity. And, and Gary Ferguson got his Equity card at uh, Disney World as a kid of the kingdom, incidentally. 
So a couple of the questions are, and of course I know a lot of these. Uh, yes. We'll talk about, so let's say young Marita, did you love singing, dancing, or acting better? Ooh, okay. That's a good one. I love, my first love is dance because when you're dancing and you're in it, this is blasphemous for religious people, but it is like touching the sun. It's like you're a god. You're just like, ha, ah, yes. <laughs> you know, you feel that God in your heart. You like, it's just beaming out of you. And then once I found that with singing, it was the same. And, and then when I'm acting and I'm in it, especially when you get a laugh, you're like, oh. But it's, it's not the same as singing and dancing where it's like the whole song or the whole time you're moving, you feel it. With acting, it's more those like, it's like a little blip, little blip here. It's different. It's, it's, um, but now, because I, I had an injury crumping in a sprint commercial <laughs> in 2015, tore my ACL. So dancing is not, um, it's not the greatest for me anymore. So I had to find my way other ways. So if- I don't know if that answered my question. <laughs> it does, because I think, you know, when we're a certain age and we, we, we are focused in a certain thing, that's kind of your passion, right? And then as things happen, as life happens, you, you kind of evolve. You start to see, oh, well, actually, I do have a good voice. That does work for me. I do enjoy doing that. Or, hey, I, I, I'm really doing this role that I enjoy doing. It's more acting than I thought I would be doing. I do. I just think we kind of ebb and flow, right? Right. Absolutely. So, what is that role you're looking for now? You know, you are, like I say, I turn on the TV all the time and I love it, I love it, I love it. What is that role you want to do now? Like what, if you could get any dream role, what would it be? Something in a sci-fi movie where I get to show my arm <laughs> <laughs> so, and shoot some aliens. Right, like Terminator Redux. <laughs> like a, um, yeah, like Riley and Aliens. Um, I loved Winona Ryder in Stranger Things. And this is a funny one because this, this, uh, my agent now, who I love, love, she told me the beginning of last, or end of last year, she said, things are changing now. You're going to actually get to play the lead. They're looking for you now. So I need you to shoot pictures like you're a leading lady and not the best friend. And I was like, I, I, it took me, like, I, it took, it, it knocked the wind out of me, like, <laughs> like, I'm not going to be, like, the Native American on a horse, or the friend that's, like, yeah, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to actually be the lead, and she's, like, yeah, get ready for it, so I had to shoot pictures, and, like, step into that, um, so I've had a few series regulars on things now, um, and I did a commercial where I played, like, a head architect, where I'm, like, pointing a lot, and for the Honda commercial, that's the one that's paying my bills right now, um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, yeah, I think boss that. ladies. Let's, let's talk yeah. about that series regulars. Was I just watching you on Hawaii Five O? Talk about some of those shows that you've been doing recently and maybe even talk about how, like what the audition process was like, the casting and then packing up to go to Hawaii. Oh, Five O was um, bizarre because when I came back from the crumping thing, um, it was like a whole new world for auditioning. Like self tape had become the thing. I did not know that was a thing. I had to relearn everything. So I did a self tape for Hawaii Five O. Um, all you get are the sides. So you research the show just like you would a musical. You see what the rhythm, the tone is, everything. And this background, like this is where I taped it right here. <laughs> and um, and it was a very like butch kind of in charge. Oh, is that still on PC? Because it's for young people. But, <laughs> but um, like I, I played a basketball coach from University of Hawaii. And I did my idea of it. And that's where the dance came in. That's where the dance always helped me in film and TV. I was like, who, how is this person move? What animal is this lady? And I was like, who? She's one of these. Um, so I found her body movements. I had like less than 24 hours to turn it around, self-taped it with my husband, who happens to be an actor and director, sent it off to um, casting. They watched it. And then three days later, I got a text saying I was the first choice, but I had to be approved by network because I hadn't been on CBS in a while. The network approved me. And they're like, you need to get on the next plane to Hawaii. 
Um, <laughs> so I got to go to Hawaii for a week, <laughs> which was amazing. Um, and everybody, you know, it's, it's, it's a, like a show like that. It's a huge show. So everybody knows what they're doing. The crew had been around since Lost. So they, these people were a family and I got to jump into it. They've been together for 25 years. Um, so it, it was just beautiful. The whole thing was aloha from beginning to end. It was like cake, you know, after all the years of practicing my time steps at the subway or doing all this other stuff that you get to stay at this hotel and everybody kisses your butt. <laughs> like, I was like, I was just doing laundry at home. Um, yeah. And and the dance again, because this was like, um, it was four cameras moving at the same time, it was basketball shot. So you, and, and the girl that I was, one of the girls I was cast as, a uh, cast with, she, um, she's, she was Nala in Lion King. She left Lion King to come and do 5-0 for the week. And um, yeah, so we just all, we all had to find the rhythm of it. Meta World Peace was in the scene and he had to find the rhythm with the basketballs and the passes. And then they had, stunt double standing by it like not that I was doing anything but <laughs> and we didn't use them but um but I love that I love a lot of people talk about you know how do you use all this stage you know training and all that well you just said it you talked about you had to get the physicality right like it was movement oriented for you to be able to build this character and then you talked about the dancing of the cameras I mean that that is what we do it is it is all choreographed and I don't think people even get that yeah it's it, it's like you know being in a musical you have to learn your lines you have to you know learn the songs all of that well making these are the same things it's literally right creating this big choreographed type of extravaganza so now that you're not in New York doing musicals right you're 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 kind of doing you know your gig out in LA um do you feel like we're, we're, we've been talking a lot about this, right? Non-traditional casting, blind casting, color content casting. Do you think that's really helping you? Does it open windows? Do you think you're still stuck in those same traps? How do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I know. It, I know. It's a hard one. It's so weird. Like when I say it, I was just listening to Shonda Rhimes. It makes my heart cry. <laughs> um, it's finally happening finally right <laughs> it's right? finally my time or our time for for women like there are more shows on tv now that have female leads than male leads finally, finally. there are more female directors that commercial i did was the first time there was a female i'd worked with a female director on a commercial ever wow. i did a pilot last year with a female director of photography i look around the sets now there's people of color oh the um the the head costumer on five O, she's um a transgender person, woman, I guess. I don't know. I'm sorry I'm saying that wrong, but whatever Erica. <laughs> she was Erica. Um and so I think the world is opening up finally and it's, well, how it's, does it's it feel beautiful. how does that feel making you go to work every day? You've 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 spent so much time in a male heavy society. Your direct people are telling you to do this, do all of that. How does it feel to have just, you just turn around and look in there, you, you see you walking around, right? You're talking to you. You don't have to kind of, you know, not scare them anymore. You know what I'm talking about. Like we used to talk and we loud and we big and we scare people. How, how do you right. go into work like that now? It, it, it's like, it's like you can finally breathe. It's like I've been holding my breath this whole time and finally I go, ah, oh. it feels like, um, you know when you're backstage and you've been in a show for a while and y'all goofing in the dressing room it feels like that Ugh. when you're working <laughs> you're like, oh finally right yeah it's just such a relief and it's so wonderful and i love working with younger people because i play moms a lot and my kids people who play my kids are like 30. um <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they're 30 playing 16 so um they they don't know what I'm talking about, and I love that they don't know what I'm talking about. They're like, right. what? Right. Like, Why think, do you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hear you. It's the same thing like the little joke I told the other day. Like, I was like, oh, all of y'all make fun of, you know, the wartime parents keeping all them grocery bags under the sink. Now y'all wiping off all your groceries when they come in the house. That's going to be a <laughs> coronavirus. It's like talking to that generation, right? It's like, oh, yeah. y'all, you don't know 
Well, you know, like what you and I joke about when we were staying in Rosario's apartment, you know, the studio <laughs> huffing down to 57th, like it's, you know, it's kind of those. All right, well, I want to ask you about something because you know yes. you have amazing arms and to go back about that. <laughs> you look back Thank on you. your body image when you began and have a different perspective on it now. I do. Yeah. I do. I ain't never going to get shorter. <laughs> So that's that. I, I'm always going to have my booty. Right. Um, yeah, so much more acceptance. Um, more so for dancers, like when I would be hired as a singer dancer or something. We had a few things. Gary and I were hired on contracts together where we had a weight clause. Mm -hmm. And you had to keep that weight. Yeah. Oh, ooh, that was hard. I had a few other contracts like that. So when somebody, I did, when I did, um, like a little tour of West Side Story, we had a weight clause. Um, I think now, if I looked back at myself then, I'd be like, girl, you all right. You just eat right, eat food, don't starve yourself, don't take those stupid diet drugs that we thought were legal. I mean, they, they were legal at the time, but the, <laughs> they were, um, they were like, like natural, all natural supplements. And then we found out some football players like had heart attacks and taking them. Um, yeah, but do you I think would mother myself. Because we had those clauses, right? We, we talked about it. Like, I think we fixated on it, don't you think? Oh yeah, in Pocahontas I had one because that costume was worth more than me. And they always told you that costume is worth more than you. <laughs> so I was like, no, I'm worth more than the costume, no. Oh, the Disney <laughs> Beast. So one of our questions is, if you start pers pursuing theater at an older age, and I think the same thing could be about, you know, film and television, is it too yeah. late to see some success in the industry without the same amount of training or experience? No, I don't think it's too late. No, I, there, I mean, there, I there's the, always stories. Right. Well, I think because we have typecasting, right? We're, we're looking for those 55-year-olds, those grandmas, they're this, they're that, right? There's, there seems to be just always be a niche market for something. Correct. Age doesn't keep you from working. Now, it might not, it might keep you from working as an ingenue. <laughs> now, you're not going to be, you're not going to be Nellie Forbush. Like, you're not going to be those parts anymore. If you're okay with that, like I went in for um, Bloody Mary for something, and and yes, they were confused. But I went in and I I, I went I walked right up and I said, "This is my real age," and then I sang, <laughs> and they very nicely told me I, I sounded perfect for the part, <laughs> and then I did not get hired. But um, <laughs> so. but yeah, no age. Um, also, stage, stage, there's a little more range. You know, you can do stuff like, they're not all up in your face. So I think you can kind of go 10 years either way, depending on what you do and how fit you are and how, how young you can act or old. It's, it's not as rigid. You can work. You can work. It's just finding your, they, they, I, we're not supposed to talk about it, but like your branding or your niche or all of that. If you can sing a joke like nobody else, or if you can, you know, if you're doing Les Mis, you'll all, they'll always need the character actor. Like, there's, those are more rare. Cool. So what do you, what, what you've got coming up now? What, what, what is Marita auditioning for? What is, what is she looking to do? Um, well, <laughs> right now things are kind of well, at a standstill. Um, with, like, right now it's just a lot of generals because um, all production shut down. So I was supposed to shoot a commercial right before uh, the COVID-19 shut down um, for Aflac. So I was going to act with a duck. I'm always acting with something funny, like a duck or an apple or a clown or something. So this time, <laughs> it was supposed to be with Aflac duck. But um, yeah, so I don't know. So maybe it will be that. Um, and, and then we'll see if there's, theater is hard right now because I have two little kids and um, I have done it, but it's kind of weird, like, it's just weird for me. I don't bring them on the road. It's not, it's not for me. Yeah, that life, is, that life is hard with kids, to travel with kids. It's just hard. So one of our yeah. questions is, you had mentioned they really pay attention to fitting the look, which we know this, right? Yes. 
Are there circumstances where they will do more makeup and hair to alter your look because they want your voice? Have you found that to be true? Where, where they'll alter, yeah. say that again. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I honestly haven't felt it to be true. There are just too many of us out there for them to work too hard on us. You know what I mean? Right. Even though yeah. I may have the right voice, you know, maybe I do this, but I'm just not old enough or I'm too old. I haven't found that in my career. Do you found, have you ever said, have you ever found anyone to say, Marita, you are so perfect, even though you're too tall, we're going to hire you anyway, or we'll, we'll age you, we'll add prosthetics. You, has anybody ever looked past your look, do you feel? Well, in voiceover, obviously, because I have the voice, I have a good voice and they don't see your voice. No, you um, have an amazing voice. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and I grew up speaking Spanish, so I can do a, pre a really good Spanish accent. So a lot of my work is Spanish market, Spanish. Um, I mean, I don't speak great, but I can read the lines enough. And I speak clearly, which is a big thing. Uh, but in terms of, let me, I want to, I want to answer this person's question. I think they'll, they'll make a jump for you, but they won't, it won't be extreme. Like for Polkanis, they gave me extensions. Um, I did a role in General Hospital where I was supposed to be a girl with really bad skin. I happen to have really good skin. But, um, <laughs> but um, they, so they did a prosthetic where I had like a mask of acne that they did on me. Um, but it, it wasn't, I mean, it was probably for that makeup person, probably six hours of work, including prep time. So no, I mean, I think the, the best answer is no, they're not going to go like, but maybe they'll wig you. That's it. Like, well, if they and, really like you. Right. And you remember, I went to that cat's call that was six foot taller and, you know, six foot and taller, but they brought you just did well. <laughs> to it. They, of course, they were not going to give me that role because that role is six foot and taller. So, but they right. did bring me in to do something else. So sometimes when the casting directors really like you, you're not right for this, but we're going to put you over here. Right. And, and the great thing about film and TV or like maybe a new work of theater is they can, they can customize it to you. Like I did this film recently where the, the mom role, she was, she was supposed, she was written as a 5'2 lady. Um, <laughs> But the dad that they wanted to cast opposite her that they loved was um, 6'2". Okay. <laughs> so I kind of got that part by default because then it made it look like, I, I mean, it didn't look like I was like at a, you know, <laughs> it looked good. So well, I got, I ended up getting this and have to put her on a stool. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So they're, they're not, they don't want to apple box anybody. Um, so, so yeah, it's more like a puzzle how everybody fits together then like maybe just changing you it's it's it, and then when they're casting families too um how how everybody like at, well when I did Saigon it was the only cast they did as a tall cast right so I finally got to do that show now when I did the poll they didn't customize the poll for me it was it was set for a 5-2 girl so I was I dislocated my shoulder and fell down <laughs> so <laughs> Like, cause you, I mean, you came down that pole and you were already on the ground. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like trying to hang up like a monkey. It did not, it was not great. But yeah, especially musicals are a little, you kind of have to force yourself. But, but, um, but once in a while they'll, they'll, I don't know. So you'll have an open-minded person. Do you have a favorite director or choreographer you've ever worked with? Oh. That's a rough one. There's so many people I like. Oh. Hmm. I think that, you know, we have such fond memories for different directors and choreographers because we were at a certain point in our life, if that makes sense. Right? right. So I think you really kind of look at those people and go, oh, you've given me this. So now I have this to add to my bag of tricks. And you can really appreciate that, I think. Oh, yeah, that's, I think, you know, some, oh, okay, I got you. So um, I had a college professor who ended up being one of the artistic directors at Laguna Playhouse. And so when I graduated from college, and then once I settled in California, she just would call me and cast me in whatever Laguna Playhouse was doing that she was working on. So I'd say Donna Inglima. 
was my, was and is my favorite director. And cool. um, she just, she always trusted me. And to add to the ethnicity thing, because Donna loved me, she would cast me as anything. I mean, they wouldn't alter my appearance. She would just present me as that thing. I did The Good Times Are Killing Me. I played the mom in that, which is, and I, I played an African-American in that. She didn't explain why I was there. <laughs> I just played that part and I sang off the music. Um, she cast me in Tambourines to Glory there. Um, and then I, she cast me in Japanese. She even repainted the set to make me look lighter <laughs> when I played the Japanese part. And then she cast white people who were six two and taller. So I looked at me. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Donna and Glima, like, because she trusts me. She trusts so, me and she knows me. So if you had, if you had to tell the next generation anything, what do you think that they should know about getting in the business? What's the one big takeaway that you think you can think of? Remember why you love this. And if you forget, it's okay to take a break. <laughs> See, I think that's so important. I think that is so important because I think we, you know, we get to all of these different things, right? Like we, we get to all these different parts in our lives and this and that. And so we start to rethink. But if you remember why you do this, all the questions that our people are asking you, like, what is your brand? What is your this? Well, I love this. So I've got to be honest about this is my brand. This is who I am. This is where I want to go. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, I do. I think that's so important. Marita, you know, I love you. Thank you so much for coming on today and hanging out with us. I think you're going to crack up. Is Jared behind us? I think. No, Jared he is not. <laughs> oh Lord. I'm going to have to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think he's next, but I love you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And we're hoping that we're going to be doing these. So I'd love for you to even come back next year and do it even a longer one with us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Mama. I love you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.